Happy Friday evening. Sorry to bring you here, but we're going to learn. Um, we're going to learn about the eye eventually. We're going to switch over to the projector. Uh, we're um, going to finish the section on lens makers' equations, which are presented here: magnification, Newtonian equation, and the, the standard object image relationship with focal length. So we're going to practice a few ideas here to finish this section off. And then we're going to apply these ideas to look at the eye, eye correction, um, and start talking about the eyepiece lens. And next week we move over to talking about optical instruments which improve our vision to see far or small, etc. Um, we're being recorded uh, today, so thank you, Matthew, and um, hopefully that will go well. And possibly this will be posted on Monday uh, sometime. Um, so, so I think that's pretty fast. Okay, so um, any questions before we begin our lecture? Just, let's just jump in then. Okay, so we introduced these, this new equation. We developed this equation from the Gaussian law. It's quantitative. What we want to do first is look at how object images distances relate to each other. And I can ask this in several contexts. I could, for example, which I'll do here, is say I have a convex lens, one that is focusing, or f is positive. Then what are the different manifestations if I'm far away like a star through to moving an object right up against a lens like a speck of dust up here? What, what are the outcomes in all those situations? Am I imaging? Do I have inverted images, virtual images, etc.? So I'm going to run through a table asking, um, answering those questions. As an exercise, you'll be asked to do F for negative lenses. So you could run through that same gamut of questions and try to reconstruct uh, the table. And, um, and then there's a couple of variations of that that um, we can discuss as we go through this. So here's the table. Um, this is straight in the text. Let's start assessing things here. So this will run over a couple blackboards. I'll start here. Table 5.3. Okay, so I'm going to have an object at some position. I'm going to do this for a converging lens, meaning F is positive. Okay, and what we want to then ask are conditions like real versus um, virtual in terms of the, the properties of the image, um, so, and where will the image be located, where, what is SI, and I want to talk about the magnification condition, and we'll start this by considering what happens, say, with starlight back to what are the symmetry points of this lens. So let's, before we begin, try to assess the problem. If, if I start off with starlight, what do I say here? I ask S0 is equal to infinity, so where does SI go? Okay, it goes to the focal point, the SI just equals F. Um, I could also assess this in terms of X0. X0 is still infinity, so where is XI? It's got to be zero, which puts it at the focal position. Same answer as we get from here. So you've got to remember what the conditions for X0, Xi are from our last lecture diagram. And then we can ask for the magnification here, which is a bit strange in this, this particular limit. So, so we're going to run through that, and I'm going to keep reducing S0. So where do you think the next sort of symmetry or interesting point might be for this lens imaging condition? So 2F, if you've got the table open, you might see it. But why 2F? What, what is interesting about making this 2F? Well, I can, ask, I can make S0 equal SI, right? Then I get 2 over S, and S is equal then to um, twice the focal length. So it turns out that I will be mapping an object, imaging it, at a position 2F away from the lens. That's equivalent to X0 equal F and XI equal to F. So we're one focal length away from the focal positions. And in this case, do I have magnification? 
should be symmetric. So I just simply map the same object, same size, onto the image plane. But it should turn out to be inverted because of the minus sign here, so mathematically. And then I can move closer now. I can move towards the fo um, approaching the focal length. And then some crazy things happen. Once this hits the focal length, SI becomes infinite. And then I can't image anymore. So then I end up creating a virtual image. The image actually moves to the left side. It's virtual. It doesn't really exist. But it appears the rays come from there. So basically, it means that under close conditions, if I move an object too close to the lens, I only get diverging rays. The lens is no longer powerful enough to focus. Once you come inside the focal length, it kind of makes sense. OK, so let's run through that whole range here then. So the first range was considering infinity for the object distance. And 2f was the symmetry point. So the equivalent range for this is infinity for x0. And this must be bigger than f. So we could try to think in both languages. So what are the properties then in this range? Well, si then turns out to be less than 2f and greater than f. So from infinity, we get f, and it only moves to 2f. So it's highly constrained under these kinds of conditions. xi moves from 0 to f. So the ranges, of course, are the same. And what happens here, then, if we look at si being relatively small to s0, we're in a place of demagnification. D, I don't think I spelled that right, D, oh yes, yeah we are, demagnify, and, um, and it's going to be negative from the MT equation, so it's a real image because SI has positive values, it's on the right side, and it's also inverted because of the negative sign there. All right, so does everyone see that kind of class? An arrangement. So you go and make some sketches then. You should do ray tracing examples with this kind of condition and see that this maps up. You can go apply things mathematically, but I don't think you get a feel of the real, real optical physics unless you're also ray tracing. So I'm going to do a couple of examples um, at the end of the section here for the harder ones. OK, so then next, continuing this table here, is the symmetry condition where S0 equals 2f. Under this condition, x0 is one focal length away. And here we end up with real inverted. It's like the case above, where si equals 2f or xi equals f. Same thing. And this is the special case where the magnification is equal to minus 1. It's inverted and just the same size. So the next range of interest is to take 2f bigger than s0. And then the special condition was at the focal position, which is equivalent to x0 being equal to 0 on this side and f on this side here. So what happens in this range? Mathematically, we'll see that SI now goes from 2F, and it shoots out forward quickly all the way to infinity. So when I go to the focal position, then by definition, the rays become parallel, and out pops um, SI to a very big value. So in this condition, over this whole range, we have a magnification magnitude that's bigger than 1. Everything's bigger now. SI is farther away than S0. So things get very big. Um, and it forms real images. And these remain inverted because SI is real. So is S0. So the ratio is automatically negative. And that's kind of the end of the imaging range that we have possible. If you try to bring this 
um, object any closer inside F, so between the focal length and the lens, what goes on here? Um, zero if that's the right way. Okay. So under these conditions, we find that SI has a value minus infinity to, to zero negative. So it becomes completely negative. Okay, so it's appears where? It appears on the left side of the lens. So the rays don't go to this point. They appear to come from this point. So if I have a point on the left side of the lens, in all cases, the rays will be diverging on the right side of the lens. So this, depending on how big or small this is, this tells me how diverging the rays are here. If, I'm, if, S, if, if SI is here, then I would have this outcome. This part is not real. And the, right, the rays on the right of the lens then demonstrate um, the real propagation given these object distances here. OK? All right, so now if I have a negative SI, what does that mean about the object? It now is erect, OK? And is it real? Yeah, it's not real. OK, so it's virtual. If I put a piece of paper here, all these rays just diverge. So it doesn't light up. It doesn't get bright. I need converging rays to overlap at some point to make an image. Okay. So I have a negative SI. And this turns out to be, it's also um, magnified. So. This is a qualitative factor. I'll talk about that um, in, by demonstration of an image. What does that mean? It's not a real image, but I can still draw an image point here given an object point from before. And I can talk about relative sizes, so it doesn't go away. OK, now I could continue this development by making S not negative. And I'm going to leave that as an exercise, but just discuss it for a minute. What do you think happens if I now move S0 to this side? I put my source here. Well, I can't physically put my source there. The light has to always come from left to right. So what I said was really wrong. What, what does it mean when I put the source point there? The rays come from here, and they go to that point. So I draw them to appear to go to that point there. That's what a negative S naught means. Okay. All right. And then what do you think this lens does? It's a converging lens. It will focus tighter. So it must do something like that. So you can come back again and assess SI. You can go back and solve values for SI or XI in those equations and walk it through to figure out the different outcomes, see if there's different ranges there. So that's an exercise for you to, to complete. So f follow this trend. See if you can reproduce this on your own. All right, don't cheat. Just go start with a blank table and find these points yourself and get the right answers applying those equations, then walk this negative, applying these, these ideas again. OK? And the second exercise, so that's exercise one. And exercise two is to repeat all of this for the negative or concave lenses or diverging lens. where you have a negative focal length. Okay? And so you're going to see quite different outcomes. You won't be imaging where you were imaging here. You're no longer imaging. You're making rays diverging. And S0 appears on the left side. 
So the practice point in all of this for you is to keep remembering S0 on the left is a real object. And when S0 becomes negative, it means the object appears to be on the right. It's not really there. It's kind of like a virtual object. And light rays are converging in from some, usually from another optical system, will create rays like this. Yes? Up. Yeah. Um, no, no, you, can, you have to look. Yeah, sorry, so I, as a separate point, it can be magnified as well. Yes. Okay. And then, same thing with the image point. Images on the right are real. Light will be converging to that image point. If you ever get an image point on the left side, then it kind of acts like a source, a virtual source. We don't call it a source, but when I write an image here, then I, as I did here, I can now guess what the rays are doing on the right side. So the object tells me what rays are doing on the left side. The image tells me what rays are doing, did I say that right? Left side for the object, right side for the image. But they, the object and image can be on left and right sides. OK? Is that clear now? Are you see, feeling the symmetry of that? So please practice through this to get familiar with all the different conditions. OK, so if I can erase this, I'll have a couple examples to practice ray tracing here. Um, so that's, I guess, exercise one, exercise two. Exercise three is to practice ray tracing. Sorry, the all. Um, all conditions. And the hardest ones are when things are negative. So I'm going to consider some of the harder cases here. I have two, two examples to do with you right here. So let's do an example of ray tracing where the object is inside F0. Okay, so that's this, um, where is that, this condition here. So I put an object between the focal plane and the lens itself. So what we expect under these conditions is erect virtual image SI will be negative. So let's not do that mathematically. Let's do it by ray tracing. OK. So here is our principal axis. Here is a lens. Let's put a focal point out here and a symmetric one here. It's converging lens. So we can write those points there. Let's make an object that's a little bit smaller than half the size of the um, radius of the lens. So I'm going to put an object here. OK, now how do we ray trace this? Here's the object. OK, so I have my focal positions. I want to find the three main rays, parallel coming in, parallel coming out, and the chief ray through the system. So the chief ray is always the easiest one to do, so let's do that first. So going left to right, I find the center of the lens, and there's my chief ray. Pretty easy to do. OK, let's go parallel. So parallel from the left goes to which focal point? It will focus to Fi. Okay? So I now find Fi, line up my eye from the center of the lens. Okay? And there's my Fi lens parallel coming in. How do I create parallel coming out? So parallel coming out is, is a light source born from F0. So I must somehow start at F0 in this case and find the light source that's the real light source. And I can say, OK, I'm going to track up to there. So let's track up to there, but then I have to go to the lens. So this is not real. I should really erase that. And then what do I, what do, I do at the lens? I go parallel. 
So there are my three main rays using F0, Fi, etc., and the chief ray. And it makes sense. I can see now that these rays have a kind of uniform spread. So where is the image? It's not on the right side. This, these rays diverge forever, so nothing ever lights up for me. So I trace backwards. So if I trace these all backwards, hopefully I'll sketch this right. Not quite right, but somewhere up here I get an overlap. And so where they overlap, I have my image point. And so where this was my object distance, now let's write that here. I can see my image distance is negative on the left side. And I can see the magnification is bigger than 1. And it's positive because SI turned negative on me. And so these rays are described as a point originating from here. Okay? And that more or less finishes this up. So I have a um, vertical, or sorry, virtual erect image. Virtual erect image to define the final outcome here. And maybe just to note that these diverging rays um, appear to come from HI. Okay? So that's what negative SI means. It's producing light appearing to come from the left side of the lens. Yes? Um, yeah, they don't need to be tied to each other. So there's two properties to measure whether it's up or down, okay, and whether it's real or, or not. So they or no, they no, they can flip around. Yeah. Okay. All right. So last point: What are the real ray trajectories here? What is the real? Is this real here? No. So only points starting from here are real, and the real paths I'll just darken as the last step. But that's real, that's real, and that's real. Okay, that's the real trajectories. And you can see how it all maps together. Is there any questions on that example? The next one's just a little bit more challenging. We're going to do a negative focal length lens. Okay, so let's consider a diverging lens as follows. So let's see if you can do this in real time. Let, try, try to learn this. Try to anticipate where things are before I write them on the board. Don't fall asleep. Don't think about the nightclub tonight or whatever is on your plans. Try to get this right while you're here. So I'm going to go to an object that's H naught here. I'm going to draw, draw a negative converging lens about the center. Okay, there. So this has um, an object, a focal length f. Now, where do I write fi and f naught? So fi is the imaging focal point. On the top, the parallel rays focus to fi. Fi switches sides, right? It's backwards. So it's easy to remember what the converging lens does, relatively speaking. So I'm going to draw here. Fi. And on an equal distance, because it's air on both sides, let's write the object position there. So these distances are f apart. But f is negative, so I better put absolute signs around it to keep track of that. To just be clear that, that we have. Um, um, negative distances for F. Okay, so S naught is positive on the left side past the focal plane. Without doing any of the math up there, let's do ray tracing to figure out what this lens will do. Will it image? Where does the image 
um, actually appear? Is it real? Et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to actually end up with four rays in here because one of them is going to be um, a wrong guess. Okay, so I'm going to kind of make a mistake on purpose, which might be a natural way to think, and then I'm going to correct myself and backtrack. But before, so, so I'm going to first pick the easiest one. What's the easiest ray to do, which, which will be correct? So we all know it's a chief ray. So I line up with the center here, and I start drawing like that and going straight through. So that's the chief ray. And let's get that under our belt. So the next thing I see is I see this ray here. Or sorry, this ray. I see this um, focal point here. I go, oh, I'm just going to draw an arrow through it. So I'm not even thinking. I, I was daydreaming. I'm just going to draw that arrow. So now where does that ray go through that lens? What do you think it does? Should it go parallel? What does it really do? Does it bend? Yeah. It actually bends down. Go steeper away. Okay? So now if you don't see that, we can do the other rays to decide why it should do that. But one thing to keep in mind is that this is a diverging lens. So anything that's diverging coming here must be more diverging on the right side. It makes the rays more diverging than they were. They could be converging, then they'll be less converging or diverging. All right, so what are the right ray trajectories? That's actually the wrong one to follow. That's the wrong point. What I, one thing I can do is I can use, like I did here, I can use the object point to make a parallel ray on the right side. But now, this is on the right side too. I use that point to make a parallel ray on the right side. How do I use that point to make a parallel ray? Go ahead. Yeah, I go through that. Normally, I would go through it on this side. But, well, if it's moved to the right side, I'll just go through it on the right side. OK, exactly right. So I aim for f naught to make a parallel ray on the right. So let's draw that trajectory. And then let's draw it as a dashed line through here. So I go through f naught as promised. But now the lens gets in the way. What does the lens do for rays that? appear to come from F naught, they become parallel. And so that's what the negative diverging lens does to this ray. So I've used F naught on the right side to make a parallel ray here. Okay, if this were a positive lens, F naught moves back to the left side, diverging rays become parallel. When it's on the right side, I still have to hit it so I hit it this way. That's the correct path, the real path of light. Everyone see that? OK. So how do I use this animal? I didn't do it right here. How do I use Fi? Go ahead. So, so I, I use Fi for parallel light on the left side, right? So let's draw parallel light on here. How do I use Fi? Do I draw light going backwards? Yeah. So I can't come backwards. I can only go forward. I've got that point and that point. So the only thing I can do is pretend the light came from there and then continue straight. OK. So there's my three main rays. This one that one and that one, using the same ray tracing rules as before. But now with things flipped backwards as a negative lens would be. So these are the harder ones to do. You have to have the other ones under your belt. You apply the same rules, but you've got to be careful with left-right directions. Yes? So, so this one, I'm trying to use Fi first, but I have to use Fi after I pass the lens. That's the, the rule. I can't use it before I pass the lens. I'm supposed to be using F naught before the lens. Uh, sorry, I have to use F naught in terms of ray trajectories on the left side. OK. So I still end up with parallel on the right from F naught. I still end up using parallel in for Fi even when it's here. And I can predict the outcomes as shown. 
Okay, so now I could guess where this goes, but for, before I do that, I'm, I'm missing a key thing. Where is the image? How do I find the image? Let's finish this off. Well, it's not on the right side, the image, because it's diverging. So it's between H0 and the lens. What I need to do is just come backwards on these ray trajectories. Let's take them back to the origin. So let's take this parallel one. Let's take this up like that. And so they meet here. So there is HI. HI, OK? And I can now write SI as this distance here. This is um, minus SI. It's negative, or I should put an absolute sign around it. SI is negative on the left side. OK, so SI is smaller than S0. It's negative on the left side. And notice the size of the image is smaller than before, and it's erect. Yes? So, um, no, SI, SI on the left is always negative. So if I use the lens maker's formula for this, I will get a negative SI. I would have to draw it at the left side. OK? Yes? Uh, I didn't quite hear the whole question. Yeah. It, three, three is useful to, to um, just ensure that um, you've got all the parts right. So if you made a mistake on one of the two rays, the third one might help catch it. Okay? That's the only reason to put it in. But two, two is the minimum. Three is safer. Okay, so the nature of HI here is that it is erect and it is um, virtual. And the magnification is less than 1 in this case here. So we see these properties by ray tracing. OK. So how do I now properly finish this guy off? Remember before we couldn't answer that. How do I actually figure out where he goes? Yeah. I've got the source point right here. So I find this point, that point. And that ray would go like that. Now I'd have to make the lens is distorted now, but it goes on that angle past the lens. OK? Can you do that yourself? <laughs> it takes a bit of practice. So we've got tutorial questions now um, posted up, new, new ones for next week. So g get into it. Start practicing this stuff. Don't go to the club tonight and take this home instead. <laughs> yes. Um, as you like. Yeah, anything's acceptable. Just try to make it clear. So we would like to see. Um, um, I, I'm just doing this free, drawing this freehand. So after you practice it a few times, you might get it straight. But if you want to use a ruler, use the ruler. Okay. OK, so I think we covered everything on those sites. So any, any additional questions? OK, so I'm going to have a couple more small topics. Um, small topics. I'm just going to kind of quickly summarize a few different points. So the, one, one, the next point then is, what if I brought two lenses together and touched them? Well, they, how do they add together? their focusing powers. How do they add together their focusing powers? I have two lenses, and I bring them together. So obviously, if I took this lens here and broke it off and touched the other lens, it should be more powerful, right? So mathematically, how do we treat that? So the next topic is combination of lenses. Okay, and this is very fast and easy. All right, so we're going to get the answer in two minutes or so. Here's lens one, lens two, F1, F2. We're going to treat them as thin lenses. 
so we can approximate, um, ignore offsets, etc. And what I'm going to have is an object distance here, and I want to calculate an image distance. So what, what I better do then is start off with S not object relative to F1. That will produce an image distance. That image becomes the object of F2. And then I apply the lens maker's formula again to find the final image point. So what I want to find in the end is SI2 after these two steps. So the question mark is what is the relationship between SI2 and SO1 given the two focal length lenses. So F1, the relationship is 1 over S01 plus 1 over SI1, and that is driven by the first focal length lens. And the second lens will have another set of subscripts 2 instead of 1. So let's just write that first and then interpret. Okay, two lens makers formulas. So what connects these two equations? This image point must lock in to that object point. That image becomes that object. So Okay, so what is the relationship? If these are thin and touching, I can ignore offsets in here. I'm going to assume that this gets super thin, so we don't need to worry about that. So if it turns out this is a true imaging lens, right, and I've produced the image on the right-hand side, SI would be positive. That point then becomes this object, but the object is on the right side. And it, what's the sign relationship then? The magnitude looks right. So you're going to comment? So it should be negative. So they are equal in magnitude, but they're negative. When this guy is on the right side, it's positive. When he's on the right side, he must be negative. So if I get plus 10 centimeters for SI1, I have to use minus 10 centimeters for SO2. Do you see that? I hope I don't have to write this, spread this out into two different questions. Go ahead. Um, it should indeed. <laughs> Thank you. F2, of course. Thank you. Make sure you put a 2 here. Okay. So is that clear then how that works? It's pretty straightforward and simple. Okay. So if I replace those in here, then this term and that term have opposite signs. I can add the equations, right? And these two terms completely cancel. And I end up with, let me go over here. I end up with 1 over S01 plus 1 over SI2 is equal to 1 over F1 plus 1 over F2. So what we see is that this is the usual um, lens maker's formula. But we have an enhanced focus, focal power. And so what we see is it's not that the focal lengths add up. The inverse focal lengths add up. So in combination, then 1 over f effective is equal to the inverse sums of the focal lengths. Okay. Or we could write the power effective is equal to P1 plus P2. 
So it's the powers that add up, which is the inverse focal lengths. So for example, if F1 equals F2 equals 50 centimeters, what is the focal length of the two lenses now together? So 50 plus 50, it's not 50 plus 50, it's 1 over 50 plus 1 over 50 equals 1 over 25. So from this formula, I would find that F effective equals 25 centimeters. So a 25 centimeter lens has shorter focal length. It has to have more curved surfaces to do that. It's a more powerful lens. It can take parallel light and focus it to a point this far away instead of this far away. It's more powerful. So the powers of the lenses add up, not the focal lengths. OK, so that's one little tidbit of information. And this kind of idea is, is useful. If you are creating an optical system, sometimes you can't buy an exact um, lens. If you want a 12.5 centimeter lens, you, you could buy two 25 centimeter lenses and um, just glue them together. Well, can't quite glue them together. You might um, take away the index on the surface, but you can um, find ways to get combinations that work well together. OK, so if we were dealing with this in diopters, right, what's the power of this lens here? So what are the units of diopters? It's got to be in inverse meters. So it's two diopters, which is inverse meters. OK, inverse meters. And it becomes um, 25 centimeters. It becomes four diopters. So it's twice the size as it was. OK, everyone following? OK, two more topics before we switch over to PowerPoint slides. Any questions? OK, so what I'm going to do is briefly talk about aperture and field stops. How many people here like conventional camera photography? Not just the iPhone stuff where you don't have to know anything. But <laughs> <laughs> Anyone use real cameras? Only one person? Oh, there must be a few. All right, so you might know things like field stop, F number, there's aperture stops, and whatever. So let, let me talk about that in the context of this course. It's just going to be very brief. I'm not going to put a lot of emphasis on it, but we should know at least these things. OK, so I'm going to switch back here. So this is uh, chapter 5.3. Um, I'm, I'm not covering the whole chapter or section in the textbook. So just if you see that my notes are much less than the book chapter, don't read the whole book chapter if, if you don't have time. Just, just read the parts that support the course notes here. OK, so I want to separate for you what an aperture versus field stop is. Okay. And so we're only going to do a, a part of the text. So we're just doing a fraction of, of that section. That's just to remind you. Okay, so let me make a sketch here of a more practical lens system. So if this is a lens here, and I put an object out here, then we're going to be imaging this onto some kind of sensor. And we're going to put some stops or blocks in. So a lot of optical systems will have something called here an aperture stop. Okay. So amongst all the rays coming through the system, or, or from the source, only some will hit the lens. But then some of those will be blocked by the aperture stop. And then these are the remaining ones. Oops, I have to draw them converging now. The remaining ones might then focus. So let's see, we're above, they have to come downward. Okay. 
So each point here radiates light in lots of directions. The lens only collects a fraction of those. And then an aperture stop can stop it down, only collecting um, a fraction of, of that light which actually came into the lens. And then we can also introduce here something called a field stop. So this is the imaging plane here because the rays converge to this point. So that point will form a sharp point here. I would put my film, my CCD sensor, or whatever type of sensor I have in this point here. So the sensor might have a certain size. So we would limit that so that in this range, this might be the range of optical design where I have non-distorted imaging. And so this thing is called the field stop. Okay. And based on this angle, right, this angle will control the depth of focus. So what does that mean? The bigger this angle, then um, the faster I will defocus if I move out of alignment. So the precision with which I align this um, could be important. That can be done quite accurately. What it really means is if I move my object in and out, then its image point will move in and out and blur in this point here. So in camera photography, we're interested in how close and far we can still make sharp images that line up close to this here. And that's controlled by this angle. So the wider this angle is, the more sensitive I am to aligning objects closer and closer to the center object alignment. Okay. So there's depth of focus. So depth of focus would be a measure then of this is the depth of focus in the object. Um, okay, so if I move this a bit closer, then I'm starting to image. Well, what, what's happening is the image plane's moving here, but my sensor's still fixed, and so those spots get bigger and blurry and merge together, and, and then I don't see anything. All right, so now here's the, the, here's the points. The um, aperture stop is usually put near the main lens, so I think I'll write this information here. So it's usually at the main design lens. So that's hard to know without more experience which one that is. But often the biggest lens could be, could be that. And what does it do? It controls the amount of light. That is collected. It also has certain additional factors that by controlling the diameter, if it's small, so when small, it reduces aberrations. Um, because when it's small, only the paraxial rays are coming through the optical system. So Snell's law is more accurate in the center of the lens. And as you go to the outside of the lens, it gets more and more challenging to have precise imaging there, unless you build lots of additional corrective optics in place. So you reduce aberrations, for example, you, have, you, you are collecting paraxial rays only. And the second thing it does is it increases the depth of focus. 
So how does it do that? It, it, mean, it makes that angle smaller in the picture above. So the more narrow that angle is, the smaller that angle is, then the more um, imprecise on focusing alignment you have. You can image objects closer and farther. Okay, so when you adjust your aperture stop, you are collecting less light. That's a disadvantage. But if you integrate the detector over longer periods of time, you can have a lot of depth of focus. So you can, for example, image your friend as well as, say, a mountain in the background. And if you open the aperture fully, then you have to be very precise. That angle becomes very, very big. And now you might only image but within, say, you know, the nose and the umbrella at the back or so of an image. And the rest blurs. Yes? Uh, what are aberrations? Aberrations are imperfections in lens design. So we, for example, discuss sine theta equal theta as an approximation. And that becomes worse as you move out from the center of the lens. So the surfaces are more curved farther away. Snell's law has bigger angles there. And they have more imperfections. And that one's called spherical aberration. And I could list a whole bunch of others, but we're not going to teach that. There's chromatic aberration, for example, color aberrations, etc. So they all compound and fight, um, become a problem. Yes? This one. Well, this angle here? Yeah. So there's the stop, D. I could put D here if you like. So D over the um, SI, this, this would be roughly SI. Should really be to the lens. Okay. So when I close this down, this bundle arrays becomes thinner. And then I could move this back and forth and still be sharply imaged. Or I could keep that the same and put different objects. And they will all be in focus when this is small. But when I open that up, this guy will blur, this guy will blur. He will remain sharp. So that's how depth of focus works in camera systems, is by reducing the stop. Yes? So what's the field stop doing? Um, field stop is more of a design stop that you don't want people to sense things outside of the design range of this. So if I try to open this up, I will start to see pin cushion or other distortion effects by this lens. It won't work well. So if I, for example, took my lens and started looking like this at an angle, I start to see distortions because the lens has all sorts of aberrations at that angle. So I better limit the field stop, so I put these things on and hang it on my ears, and that, that's a kind of field stop control. Not, not exactly, but, but that, that's the idea. So, so this means that I can get good imaging in this field stop. I lock it in, and it becomes permanent. So your iPhone um, standard cameras, it might just be the sensor size. That's your field stop. Okay. If we go to a telescope, um, you could try to put bigger film on a telescope, and you'll get all sorts of distortions outside it. So field stops are put in place to say, this is the working design where you can see undistorted images. So would the top of the field stop need to really be above the uh, axis? Um, this is symmetric. There's the principal axis. So I can put well, light would be under the axis, though, inside that. Uh, sorry? Inside the, the field stop, all that light is under the axis. Under the axis? Um, the that's top. just light from this point. Where, where's light from the tail go? So what, what I didn't talk about is that I'm only talking about light from this point. So now if I take the tail, this makes all its ray trajectories. And there's another bundle of light here doing this with the same similar angle. And that bundle of light is coming from the tail. right? And then if I put a double arrow like that, this point here will make another bundle that appears here. It's upside down. All right? Yeah. So at some point, I can only see this size is recorded, controlled by the field stop. And if you try to go bigger than that, then you start to require bigger angles through the lens, and distortions start to come. And so we try to control that by designing a field stop near the detection side and an aperture stop um, at the lens, which controls brightness and depth of focus. OK, yes? Well, 
Um, yeah, this is the field of view here. Okay. It, it may not be exactly at the lens, so there's, there's, there's a lot more complicated than I'm presenting it. The, these are just the simplest notions, so you can look at an, an optical instrument. This is not a full optics program where, if, if you go to an optics school, you might actually end up taking like, like 20 different optics design courses. This would be like the first one, these few weeks, and then it builds into much more complicated um, considerations. So we're just giving you enough that you can talk to a professional optical engineer and understand them probably. But you need more training if you want to become a full-fledged optical designer. Okay, so lots of questions, lots of interest. That's really good. Um, I'm just introducing these things in a qualitative way, not a quantitative way. I'm not going to ask um, any hard question except maybe what does an aperture stop do would be sort of a, a question I could ask on a, a test or exam for one mark. That would be it. So you'd remember that an aperture stop does that. So the field stop, just to finish this off. Okay, so it would sort of limit the image area to a CCD or film sensor for distortion free. by the optical system. Okay, then the last discussion point on this is the F number. Just throw it here. So on the drawing I have a diameter D, which is the open diameter in which light comes through the lens. And I have a focal length and so the F number is equal to um, F, the focal length of the lens, over the aperture stop. So a lens would have a maximum D. So what does it mean? A more expensive lens which has bigger diameter, and they're harder to design with shorter focal length. So the hardest, most expensive lens, well, not necessarily telescopes could be made that way, but one, one very hard thing to do is make short focal length lenses with big diameters. So, for example, an F number equal to, say, 1.4 or so would be a very good um, fast lens. It's fast because it collects a lot of light. So you're trying to make a diameter that's bigger than the focal length, and you have very big angles through the lens. You're, Snell's law, you have to use the sine theta, not theta approximation. So you need lots of extra lenses to, to correct themselves so that you get very accurate distortion-free imaging. So 1.4 is a very good lens. And it's bright, meaning it collects light efficiently. Or fast. Actually, we should use fast. That's the optical term. So it collects light efficiently. And if you make this, say, 16 or, tw or let's say 22, then you could actually have this lens and stop it down. You could reduce the diaphragm to 22. And now you're throwing away a lot of light, right? So if you make it half the size as before, then one quarter of the light is coming through by squaring the area. But then you end up getting, by stopping it down, you get bigger depth of focus by this effect here, OK? And so you have those kind of benefits to control and play with. So that's weak light collection. OK, and if you are buying lenses um, for cameras, and if you want, um, you pay a lot more to get this value smaller and smaller. So it's very easy to get like an F, say, 3 or 5 lens. But if you want to take it down to these very fast lenses, the lenses has to get bigger in diameter, have lots more correction. They get very expensive. OK, yes? Um, a couple of questions. On the board where you wrote field stop, what is, is that APB? 
CCD, CCD is a charge coupled device. It's a silicon based sensor. It's, it's um, in, there's different, uh, there's other types of technology, but these are transistors which um, um, we are sensitive to light and um, they turn to charges and then the charges are counted, etc. It's a number sign. Okay. Hashtag is that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that's that's all I'm going to say about aperture stops and cameras. Um, lots of there's lots of vision systems out there where these would be the characterization that we use. So the last section I have. Um, I wonder, do, what if I spend um, five five or eight minutes to finish this, then we take a break for a few minutes, or do you want a break now? I'll finish the blackboard notes and then I'll, I'll the, give me a chance to switch gears, okay. So I'm going to spend just these last less than 10 minutes on mirrors as optical devices. So I'm not going to put a lot of emphasis on the course, but let's talk about mirrors as an optical device. And can, can I, cl uh, I better close this off here. So 5.4, and we're only doing a fraction of this section too. Mirrors. Okay, so I have three types of surfaces to consider. Ellipsoid, parabolic, and spherical. So how does optics play in each of these shapes? What does an ellipsoid do in terms of focusing ellipsoid shape? What do we know mathematically about an ellipse that you might remember from high school? What does an elliptical shape do? So an ellipsoid shape has the property that if I have a light source at focus one, it doesn't matter what path it takes, they all do one reflection and they focus to focal point two. Okay. So it's a perfect kind of imaging shape. It's an ellipso ellipsoidal shape. I should make it 3D. And so any light from focal point one focuses perfectly to focal point two according to the laws of reflection. So we're basically using theta r equals theta i, the law of reflection here. So the law of reflection at each point on that surface is always satisfying this condition. Okay? So you should have remembered in high school that there's these things called two foci and ellipse. So if I create that shape, then I could have a mirror that does that, but it's only fixed for that kind of condition. What does a parabolic surface do as a mirror? So parallel light coming in goes to the perfect focus. Parabolic. Did I not spell it right? Parabolic. <laughs> Okay, it's Friday, I, Friday night. I, <laughs> what else can I say? So there's parallel rays coming in, and they will satisfy the law of reflection at each interface point, and they all cross here without aberrations. Only diffraction theory is the limit. So we get a common focus for parallel rays. So these kind of perfect devices are really hard to make and machine. You have to use special numerical milling machines. You can buy these surfaces, etc., for special cases. Um, they're not really that great in the UV spectrum, so-so in the visible. They're, you see them more in the infrared spectrum because the wavelengths are bigger and the surface imperfections are more tolerant. What is far, far, far more common and easy to make is the spherical ones. So these are not perfect. But 
cheaper to make. Um, oh, it is perfect under one condition. That's how we're going to find its focal length. Where is a spherical surface perfect for focusing? Well, if I have light emitting from this point here, what shape mirror do I make that collects all the light and focuses focuses it to a single point. It's a spherical surface of radius, any radius r, centered over the object. So all these rays will hit and reflect back exactly on the same angles to coincide with the center. So it has a special symmetry, too. Okay. So what is the focal length of this? How can I derive the focal length? What is F? R, is R right? It's not, it's not R. What is the object distance here? These rays go out. Okay, This is 1 over R. And where does it image? That's R. S naught equals R. Now sign convention, we have to do sign convention different because the light comes back. So we're going to write that as 1 over R. The sign convention reverses. And that's equal to 1 over F. And so it turns out that the focal length for a sphere, mirror, is equal to R over 2. OK? About that. So R seems like the first guess, but it's wrong. My object is this is the symmetry point. This is like the 2F point away. So diverging rays will focus back here. Because of spherical, um, well, no, that's actually perfect. That's the only place where the lens is perfect. When I move away, I get spherical aberrations. So it does distort a bit. OK, so we're almost done. So if we're going to use a mirror, we have to change the sign convention. Did I get that right? Yeah. So if I use a spherical mirror sign convention, then if I have um, a point source like this, then it can focus to places like this. So if this is s naught then this distance would be SI. Um, let me move this away. Sorry. So the sign convention is changed now. Um, SI is positive. And R is positive in the above figure. I haven't drawn R yet. So, so SI on this dimension is positive. And also, the radius of curvature, which would be here, is also now considered positive in this shape, because it has to be converging the rays. So I'm not going to focus much on, on these kinds of examples. but. We do see mirrors in a lot of places. So you can apply what you've learned already to this to do imaging. So, so here, um, rays from far away, rays from infinity would go to r over 2. And um, as you bring this object in, you can still use the lens maker's formula as before, but just change the sign convention like that. Okay, And you just say f equals r over 2. That's all you need to say. OK. So I think that's all I need to say. Um, I'm going to switch over to the eye. If there's no questions, we'll just take a break for a few minutes. And let's start back here. Let's start back here at half past 7. We'll do 30 minutes of the eye.
Thank you.